I don't quite know how to ask this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Are you bored? Now, I, I, I know it sounds like a strange question to start a sermon with, right? But I think it's one that we think about. So let me ask it again. Are you bored? Now, I, 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 I'm not talking about right now because, I mean, who's going to be bored at church, right? We've got amazing music. We've got wonderful people. We have a pastor who's so eloquent and funny and charming and expressive and caring. So enough about Amy, right? We're not going to talk about Amy anymore. So, right? so I'm not talking about being bored at church. I'm not even talking about being bored with your plans of, of your daily life. I'm not talking about those. But instead, I'm talking about, are you bored in your relationship with God? Are you bored in your relationship with God? After all, time, it, it tends to happen in most relationships, right? But think about it. The beginning of our greatest relationships, it's so exciting, right? You want to be with them all the time. In fact, you want to be with them so much that you start to adjust your schedule just so that you can make sure that you're with them as much as possible. You want to learn all you can about them. You want to know what they're thinking in every situation, be it a good situation, be it a bad situation. You want to know what they're thinking. And of course, you want to see how, how, they, how, how they're going to respond when they get to know you. And they start to understand what you're thinking. You know, there's always such an amazing energy and excitement at the beginning of a relationship, and then time passes, right? You spend more and more time together, and it just seems to continue and continue. So you learn more about them. You know what they're thinking in every situation, be it a good situation or a bad situation. You have seen how they have responded as they've gotten to know you more and, and a little bit more about what you're thinking. And if we're not intentional, as this process continues, if we're not intentional, then that fire, that passion, that energy that, that's present at the beginning of all great relationships, it becomes nothing more than dying embers, just hoping and praying for a breeze that's going to keep them glowing. You see, this is because we move, we tend to move from a place of cherishing the other to taking the other for granted, right? The new becomes old. The exciting, not so much. The shiny becomes dull. And I think that it only gets worse as the average attention span of the modern world shortens every year, right? We get bored. And we get bored quicker and faster nowadays. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but let me ask you. Does this accurately describe your relationship with God? Are you bored in your relationship with God? Are you in a place where you are simply going through the motions? Right, it's Sunday morning, right? I have to go to church. I have to go to church because it's Sunday morning, right? I mean, it's what they do. And besides, they got donuts and somebody's got to eat them, right? It's, it's Sunday morning. Or you know what? Hey, I, I guess I'll read my Bible today because that's what all good followers of Jesus have to do, right? We have to read our Bibles, or, of course, you know, I, I, I always have my prayer time. I always have my prayer time. Right as I sit down at the table to eat dinner, you know, that's when I do my prayer. We've done it in my family for years. It's tradition, right? Or, you know what? Hey, I went above and beyond. I signed up to be an usher or a greeter at church because Chad said I had to. So, yeah, I, I did that. Or you know what, I, I did give to the church last year because it gives me a little bit of a break on my taxes. So I gave to the church. If any of these ring true, because these are your motivating factors, if any of these ring true, then you are probably bored in your relationship with God. And I say probably because the other alternative is that you probably were never really in a relationship with God to begin with. And I know that sounds harsh. It sounds harsh. It sounds like something we don't want to talk about in church, right? But family, the problem is, is that this is where many followers of Jesus are today. They're bored. I recently read an article by Elizabeth Woodson. She's with Village Church down in Flower Mountain, Texas. And in this article, she said this. She said, there are many socially acceptable things to confess in the church, but boredom isn't one of them. It can feel shallow and selfish to say that our relationship with God is no longer interesting or exciting. If we're honest, though, most of us will experience seasons of life where our faith feels stale. 
morning devotionals, Sunday sermons, and worship playlists don't evoke that same passion that they once did. This loss of joy functions as a symptom of a greater problem, a warning light on the dashboard of our lives. It tells us that we have allowed lesser loves to overtake our love for God. So let me just ask, how many of you all have ever had one of those dashboard lights come on in your vehicle? You ever experienced that? I mean, some of y'all never had any problems, car problems. Fantastic. That's awesome, right? It normally happens. And normally when that light comes on there on your dash, you do one of two things, right? You either work very diligently to make sure that it, that it goes away, right? You want that light to go away. You try to, you try to fix what's happening. You want to you alleviate the problem, right? That's the first thing. So you want to work on it. Or the second thing is you live with it, right? And you live with it to a point until you're, you're driving down Highway 75, doing 75 mile an hour, and you're on the way to Owasso to get Chipotle, and next thing you know, your transmission drops out, right? It did not happen to me, but it did happen to somebody that I know. And yes, they literally were going for Chipotle. I'm serious, right? So I'll tell you, these two things, they, one is going to lead to renewed life, and the other is going to ultimately lead to a life of ruin. So family, I want us to do the work necessary that's needed to get the warning light of the dashboards off our life, right? We want that to turn off, and I want us to, to be able to remove those, those lesser loves that have overtaken our love for God. And I know that seems like a daunting task, right? I mean, to fight boredom, right? I mean, that's what that's every TV station in the world is trying to fight boredom, right? News stations are getting ready to try to fight boredom. Your, your radio is trying to fight boredom. Everybody's trying to fight boredom, Right? But I'll tell you, the work is not really that hard. In fact, the work is very simple. It's showing up. It's showing up. But before we get too far down this path, let's join our hearts in prayer, asking for God to speak to us today. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, there are times in our lives, Lord, where we have allowed the lesser to overtake the greater with you being the greater. And God, we've kind of put you on the back burner sometimes where we've actually just completely forgot. And God, I know that's not a place that any of us want to be in. It's not a place that we want to talk about in church. God, we want to, we want to give that impression that we have it all together, that we are living those faithful lives. God, that there's not that, that dashboard light that's just blinking over and over again. So God, I pray that as we think about this today, as we begin to process this in our own lives, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to see what we need to see. God, that you help us to hear what we need to hear. And God, the only way we can do that is by inviting you to speak as we, your servants, listen. In your son's name we pray. And the church said, amen. Well, today we're starting a new sermon series entitled, Show Up, A Call to Everyday Faithfulness, right? Show Up, A Call to Everyday Faithfulness. And in this series, we're going to do the work to combat that boredom and to rekindle that fire that we once had in our relationship with God. And I already told you the key, right? I told you the key from up front. In fact, this is the same key that we're going to talk about next week and the following week, okay? That is not an invitation for you not to come to church, okay? But instead, I'm telling you that this, that it's literally that simple, right? The key is showing up, showing up. I'll tell you, when I hear those two words, I'm reminded of a quote that I've shared in a previous message. Uh, it was a few years ago. It was a quote from Joe Madden. For those of you who don't know Joe Madden, Joe Madden was the skipper for the 2016 World Series Chicago Cubs. <laughs> right? Nothing's happened since then, but ha-ha, <laughs> that's great. Right? But he, he shared this with the team, and he shared this before the season even started, right? In spring training. In spring, spring training, he told them, be present, not perfect. Be present, not perfect. How many of y'all remember that sermon from way back? Thank you for the one hand. I appreciate that. That's awesome too. All right. Wow. All right. So, but he said, be present, not perfect. He goes on to say, I don't want anyone to ever go on the field afraid to make a physical mistake because that will lead to a mental mistake. In other words, what Joe is saying, he's saying, show up right? Show up. Yes, you're going to make mistakes, but you're never even going to have a chance of success if you never show up. And since I already used that quote once before and even thought I was great and I love that quote, I figured I'd find a new quote with, to share with you this morning. 
And I found one maybe from a, you know, a source, maybe not the best of source, but I found one anyways. And I found one from Woody Allen. Woody Allen, who once said that 80% of success is showing up. 80% of success is showing up. So I, I read this and I'm like, wow, that's that, okay. What's this all about? And so I began to read an article about this quote. And the author said that the quote by Woody Allen suggests that simply being present and committing to a task or goal is a major factor in achieving success. This means by consistently making the effort to be physically present and engaged in the work or pursuit at hand, you are significantly increasing your chances of success. It can be easy to become distracted or lose motiva motivation, aka get bored, right? By, but by making the conscious decision to show up and put in the work, you're setting yourself up for success. He goes on to say that this quote serves as a reminder that the simple act of being present and committed can have a major impact on our ability to, to succeed. It's a reminder to stay focused, to stay dedicated, and to make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. So always try to be present and put in the effort and success is likely to follow. This positive and uplifting message can serve as motivation to stay committed to our goals and work towards success. 80% of success is showing up. So what does success look like when it comes to a relationship with God? What does success look like for us? I think it looks like two things. First of all, I think it looks like growth. Growth, right? And we're going to talk about this more. Um, we got Back to Church Sunday coming up on the 15th. And then that next Sunday, we start our Let's Grow series. And so it's going to be the Let's Grow series. Thank you. All right, we're going to work on that one too, right? But we're going to do that series, so that's going to be coming up. So I think that, is the, that there's an element of growth when we succeed in our relationship with God, and I think it also looks like faithfulness. And faithfulness, remaining faithful to our God, who is always and will always be faithful to us. And family, when these two things happen, right, when, when these two things start to come together, I will tell you, boredom is gone, and excitement takes its place. So let's look at our scripture for today. You're going to see what I mean. Please join me in your Bibles to Paul's second letter to his protege, Timothy. Uh, Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, and we're going to be in chapter 2 today. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 11. This morning I'll be reading from the NIV, that's the New International Version, just in case you want to follow along word for word. So 2 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11. And I invite you to listen for the word of God this morning. Because Paul says this, he says, Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are what church? Faithless. He remains what church? Faithful. For he cannot disown himself. For he cannot disown himself. God cannot be anything other than what God is. And what God is, is faithful. Amen? God is faithful. Now, before we get too far, I want you to know a few things about Paul and Timothy and this trustworthy saying that we just looked at. First of all, we need to know that Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him amidst his ministerial work, right? I'll tell you, pastors, they need that level of encouragement, especially from somebody who's walked those steps before, right? That's what Paul's doing. He's trying to encourage Timothy to remain faithful in his work. As I said, Timothy was Paul's protege. Timothy, at this point, is probably a young man, somewhere between 30 and 35 years old, who's been Paul's traveling companion. And at the time of this letter was written, he was working at the church of Ephesus. Now, we were in Ephesians for our last series, right? And so we were in that book, and then that book was written to the church at Ephesus. And so we're just kind of continuing into that just a little bit as we see who's now there leading the church, and it's Timothy. So Timothy is doing what he does, right? He's, he's sharing the good news. He's sharing the gospel of Jesus with all who would listen, right? While Paul, on the other hand, found himself in prison. And he feels this strong need to write to Timothy and to do so one last time, which is exactly what happened as this would be Paul's final letter. So knowing this, knowing that Paul was in prison for his faith, when Paul speaks of faithfulness, we know that it's not a cliche. We know it's not just something that he's saying. Paul is actually living it out in a very dramatic way. And over the course of this letter, Paul talks a lot about faith, a lot about faith. 
You see, Paul begins his letter with a a shout out to Timothy's mom and grandma, Lois and Eunice, faithful women who impacted Timothy and, and passed along to him a sincere faith. But he also gives kind of a negative example of two people who deserted him because their faith faltered. It's it's Phagelus and Hermogenes. And what we see from Paul's word and what we see from his life is that the Christian faith, that following Jesus is not always easy. I mean, look where it got him. He's in prison awaiting certain death. But yet in the same breath, Paul also says that the only thing, the only thing to get through is the strength and the grace of God. It's God's power in us. This is the only way that anyone can endure in the faith. Another thing we need to know about this, about our passage for today is it's a common quotation of the day. This is why you hear Paul say that this is a, a trustworthy saying. Thomas Constable in his notes on 2 Timothy said that in order to encourage Timothy further to endure hardship, Paul cited or perhaps adopted a commonly accepted and used quotation that encouraged believers to remain faithful to the Christian profession. Now, it may be in a part of a baptismal ceremony or a hymn or a catechism. We're not, we're not quite sure where the, the trustworthy saying came from. But what this saying is telling us is that any faithfulness of our own, right, any faithfulness of our own is rooted in Jesus. It's the only way that it happens. This is what we see in that very first statement, right? If we die with Christ, then we live with him. And I'll tell you, we still speak this truth today, and we see it clearly in the act of baptism, Secondly, we see that our endurance will be rewarded. Third, we understand that that if we choose to reject Jesus, then that choice will be honored. And then the saying ends with the truth that for those who believe that our faithlessness does not change God's faithfulness to us and to his purposes. As I said before, God is God and God's character is not dependent on ours. Thank you, God, for that. Amen? Amen. God remains faithful always because God cannot disown himself. Therefore, he will not deny even unprofitable members of his own body. God's faithfulness to Christians is not contingent on their faithfulness to him. And church, I want to make sure that you really hear that. God's faithfulness to us is not determined by our level of faithfulness to him. It's not. But instead, Our faithfulness to God is a response to his faithfulness to us. A response to you and I being loved and accepted unconditionally. You see, this love does not require a response, but often elicits one as the spirit of God works in us. And this is why Paul's challenge to Timothy, that's why it still stands, right? He says to be faithful in the ministry. It's not out of place for him to tell him this. It is the appropriate response to God's faithfulness. Now, I just want to pause for just a moment right here and check in with you all. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I want to do that by making sure that we understand this word that I've already used about 40 times already this morning, right? It's that word faithfulness. It's that word faith or faithlessness, right? It's faithful. And faithful embodies many meanings. The simplest meaning is faithful is being full of faith. I always cringe when they use the word, the the root word in the definition of it. I get it. I really do. I mean, full of faith, faithful, full of faith. I understand that. I get it. But it makes me have to read on, right? I just want a simple answer right there. My attention span is not that long. Let's, Let's continue, right? But if we do read on, we learn that faithful also means loyal. It means a firm, it means firm in adherence to promises, And so when we hear this word faithful, you know, we we start to envision a lot of different things in our lives, right? We might envision many things. And for me, one of the things that I envision is a golden retriever, right? How many of you all ever, you think of a golden retriever and think of faithful, right? I mean, I picture my dad's old golden retriever, Molly. Molly was an amazing dog. She was as faithful as they come. She really was, right? So we think about, you know, maybe dogs who are faithful. We think about that people who are faithful, right? We think of someone who might be committed to a a, a cause like autism awareness or or a fight against homelessness. Think about people who are faithful. But hopefully for us as followers of Christ, when we hear that word faithful, hopefully our minds instantly go to our God who never lets us down. 
You see, I don't know if you thought of this or not, but all of these things, right? I'm talking the golden retrieval and, and the people that are committed to a cause and God, all of these things share a commonality. And that commonality is consistency. Everybody say consistency. However, for many of us, there's nothing that we want more in our lives, right? Nothing that we want more than to deepen this walk with God. But yet there's nothing that we find more mundane that we find more rote, dare say boring. A.W. Tozer said that the Christian faith is not so much what you believe, but about how you behave, how you live it out in a consistent manner. And to live out our faith, we must go to the source. We have to go to the source. I'll tell you, even as I say that, I want to remind you what I've been saying over the last few weeks. And I'll tell you, I'm going to continue to say as long as I have breath, because this, this change has really helped me. You see, I want to remind you of this shift in our minds that, that needs to take place as we relate to God through Jesus. And this shift is going to propel us forward in the Christian life. And this shift is that following Jesus is not a list of have-tos, but instead it's, a, it's full of get-tos. Do you hear the difference? It's not about the have-tos, but instead it's get to. And to live out faithfulness, we get to make time to connect with God. Now, I know that you know this. There's lots of ways to connect with God, right? In your Bible and, and, and praying and coming to church and being a part of a small group that, that really does life together, right? Walking in nature, listening to a podcast or, or audiobook that helps to, to understand Scripture better, encourages your faith. Some people do it by creating art and serving others. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of ways that we can connect to God. But, but church, hear me when I say this. If we're going to grow in our faithfulness, then we've got to show up. And show up means consistency. That's the key. Growing and maturing in Christ and becoming more faithful is a lifelong journey. It's not a quick fix. It's a lifelong journey. And we get to embrace that. Eugene Peterson, you might know him as the Message Bible guy, right? Eugene Peterson once said, he says, there is a great market for religious experience in the world. There is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue, little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. You see, here's the truth is that we could put on the mask. We could put on the mask and, and that makes everyone else think that, you know, we are the most faithful of believers. We can do that. But unless we are truly leaning into the parts, the hardest parts of that journey, then we're going to miss the growth. So church, we show up or we miss out on Jesus. We show up or we miss out on Jesus. Faithfulness is showing up. The simple act of being present and committed. And when you think about it, when you think about it in your own life, we have many real world examples of what it looks like to show up. And of course, the best example that we have, of course, is, is God, right? As I said, God is faithful. God always, always shows up. Or maybe we start to get a little closer in and we say, you know what? Hey, our best friends, our best friends, they, they show up or they wouldn't be our best friends, right? Or we talk about a faithful spouse, a faithful spouse is, a spouse is one who doesn't wonder infidelity or complacency, but shows up as a partner, ready to ride that roller coaster of life with you. Or maybe in, in the work world, you, you can think about a faithful worker. A faithful worker doesn't come in 10 minutes late you know, all the time or duck out when there's work to be done. They stay on task. Or maybe you might be thinking about a faithful church member, right? A faithful church member, they don't just appear on the high holy days of Christmas Eve and Easter. You see, family, everyday faithfulness starts by showing up. We got to show up. And as followers of Christ, we get to show up and hang out with Jesus. And that should bring a smile to your face right there, church. That's what we get to do. We get to show up and we get to hang out with Jesus. Man, there's nothing better than that. You know, we also, we get to show up as partners to support one that, ones that we've committed our lives to. We show up for our kids by being the parent and offering them radical acceptance and love and empathy so that they can be safe and secure as they grow up. 
We show up in our work life so that the tasks are completed and progress is made. We show up in our communities because we know that investing in others makes for stronger, healthier communities. Is it fun sometimes? Absolutely. Is it fun all the time? Absolutely not. And yet faithfulness says that we keep showing up every time. And with the Spirit's help, we do so looking a little bit more like Jesus every time. Now, I'm not going to go deep into this right now because over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at practical ways of how we can consistently show up in the world around us. But for now, what I want to do is I want to give you a caution. I want to give you a caution because many times when we try to figure out what what showing up looks like, what everyday faithfulness looks like, we start to look around at others, right? We do that. Oh, that's so-and-so. She's always volunteering at the church. Oh, of course, there's old so-and-so. Man, he is always talking about Jesus. He, he talks about Jesus from dusk till dawn or dawn, dawn till dusk. Was that right? Which one? Morning to night, whichever one that is, right? And then he continues. Of course, then we can't forget about old so-and-so who's got the Bible memorized, tells you everything in the Bible and exactly where it's located. And we can't forget about, you know, pastor so-and-so who has his sermons memorized and who is such an eloquent speaker, who's always engaging those listening, who has good jokes with great timing, who has good hair, who's a strong leader inside and outside of the church. And that list goes on and on. Okay, enough of that. As you can tell, I do some looking too. I do. But here comes that caution. And church, I'll tell you, I'm preaching to myself when I say this. One of the most crushing things that we can do to ourselves is to compare our call to faithfulness with someone else's. You see, we each have different circumstances, abilities, and limitations, and how we show up in the world is impacted by those things. But these things do not change our call to faithfulness, but it does affect how it's lived out. So what I want you to do for just a moment, I want you to think of of faithfulness in terms of stewardship. Okay, stewardship. Stewardship is doing the best and the most with the gifts that have been given to us. And we're going to explore more of this in the coming weeks. But for a quick reference, I want you to think of the parable of the faithful stewards in Matthew 25. You might remember the story, right? This is where where the master comes and he gives three servants three different amounts, right? To one, he gives five coins of gold and to another, he gives two and then another, he gets one. And then he leaves town and he wants to see what they're going to do with what they've been given. Two of them double their amounts, And the third, the one with only one, did nothing with his. The first two, what do they hear, right? The first two hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness, right? You've been a faithful steward. To the third, the one who didn't show up with any return on what was given him, what does he hear? He hears you wicked, lazy servant, Throw that worthless servant outside where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I know that sounds severe, right? Sounds so severe. But the point of the parable is that we will all be held responsible for what God has given to us. We will. We're going to be responsible for what God has given to us, but we're not going to be responsible for what God has given to others. Only what God has given to us. So we ought to be stewards, good stewards of all that we've been given. We have to treat that carefully, but not do that through comparison or competition. You see, simply put, stewarding our energy and our times and our gifts and our resources means that's how we show up. And how we show up is going to be different from the people next to us, depending on what God has given us to steward. Let me give you some examples. You see, the faithful person could be the one who literally goes and and funds a whole new PICU at the hospital right? A, a, a prenatal uh, um, uh, ICU. It could be the one who gives $5 to the homeless person outside of Walmart. They're still being faithful on different levels. It could be loving, excuse me, living a, a quiet life, raising your children, volunteering at their school, and making sure that they have dinner each and every night. Or it can be spending the halls of Congress enacting policies that serve families and students. It could be literally be praying in the quiet hours of the morning, or teaching scripture to the masses through your writing or through preaching. In God's kingdom, faithfulness is found in showing up in the big and small things. 
and doing it all in the power of the Holy Spirit. It can be found in a monastery. It can be found in a cathedral. It can be found in an alleyway. It can be found in a school. It can be found in a business. It can be found in a supermarket. Church, we are simply called to show up, not show other people up, but we are called to show up because faithfulness grows with consistency rather than comparison or competition. Family, we're called to show up. We're called to show up and, and, and we show up because of who we are and because of Christ in us. And as we show up, our faithfulness grows as Christ transforms us. And what we need to keep in mind is that our spiritual growth and the ability to find complete joy in God, those things are intertwined. The more we come to know about him and allow ourselves to be transformed by truth, then the more our hearts are supernaturally shaped to love what he loves. You see, the joy in this is that we don't have to compare ourselves to the other believers around us. We don't have to do that, right? Because when we all show up in the power of Christ, it isn't about who is the better believer. It's about showing up in a world that needs what we can offer. It's about each of us growing and identifying ourselves as Christ-like people, living into that, that identity, faithful to his work in and through us. And I'll tell you that when we do this, when we do this, that, 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 that fire that's within us is rekindled, it's strengthened, and boredom is replaced with excitement. Stagnation is replaced with joy. Anxiety is replaced with hope. Depression is replaced with peace, and doubt is replaced with love. It's what happens when we show up in this relationship with God. So as I wrap up, let me leave you with the ending of that article by Elizabeth Woodson, that article that I shared earlier about being bored with our relationship with God. She ends the article this way. She says, in seasons of spiritual boredom, the road back to joy is one where we first see the wrong turn that we might have taken and come back to the place that first cultivated our joy in God. It's where we sit in the truth of passages like Psalm 19. If you've not read Psalm 19, I encourage you to read that. It's just, it's an uplifting passage. But it's where we sit in the truth of passages like Psalm 19, living in awe and magnitude of the glory of our God, or where we meditate on the depths of his character while seeking to emulate those same attributes in our own lives. It's a space where we realize that to know him is to be part of his mission seeing ourselves as conduits through which he works to impact this world for his glory. And there's nothing boring about that. If you are in a season of your life where you might be bored with your relationship with God, I want you to hear this one last time this morning. To show up. To show up. And as you show up, remember, God is already there. Show up. Because this is how we live everyday faithfulness. Family, it's all about showing up. Will you pray with me?